good morning to uh, readers and authors and viewers of this uh, episode of uh, EJ Live. And I have with me Dr. Michelle Burgess Castella from the University of Edinburgh. And we are publishing Entrepreneurial Justice, Syria, the Commission for International Justice and Accountability, and the Renewal of International Criminal Justice. So there's a lot going on in that title. Yes. And th the main thesis is that the, this, international, uh, this Commission for International Justice and Accountability, uh, which you have conceptualized as an instance of entrepreneurial justice, is filling a gap in the official uh, zone of international criminal law. So maybe we can start, if you would make the case why the ICC and the normal structures are not doing a good job in Syria. And then we can move on and understand what is the role of the Commission for International Justice and Accountability. Great. Well, I think as we're all familiar, um, we saw in the 1990s this euphoria about the promise of accountability through international criminal justice mechanisms um, created through the Security Council, the um, International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia and for Rwanda. Um, and in some ways then the ICC was the end product of that decade and it promised a lot. Um, and I think a lot of people still have a lot of hope for, the, for, for what the ICC can, can bring, but there's also now a lot of disillusionment in terms of its slowness, its jurisdictional patchiness, which is not as all-encompassing as we had seen with the earlier tribunals. And obviously Syria, I think, exemplifies this soul-searching in the field because to date there has been no ICC action vis-a-vis um, -vis Syria. I mean, maybe we'll get some action in terms of Jordan um, and its its link um, to Syria, but otherwise, because Syria is not a member of, of the court, um, essentially that conflict has just been forgotten. Um, and obviously, as well as we know, we also have had the double veto um, through China and Russia that has effectively um, ruled out any Security Council action. So that then really raises a question of, okay, do we have any type of other way that we can bring in international criminal justice accountability mechanisms. If the ICC can't act, should we then raise up some new sort of ICTY um, mechanism? Um, or what other avenues do we have available? But I really think, me personally, I feel that the tragedy that we've seen in Syria is quite challenging. If you have any hope or faith in international criminal justice, and then you see what's happened in Syria, and I've lived there myself, before the war, it's quite, it's quite perplexing. Should we actually invest any more in the field of international criminal justice? And that, that's what really drove me to focus on this question in this, in so, this article. Thanks. So despite uh, a certain measure of critical skepticism, etc., on the whole, you seem to be rather enthusiastic about the work of the Commission of International Justice and Accountability. So first of all, just Tell our readers, not too much, we want them to read the article, <laughs> but tell our readers a little bit about what it is, what its genesis, what it's doing, uh, this, yeah. this commission. Yeah. It sounds very, very, uh, a very official type of body, but in fact it's a private enterprise, isn't it? It is, it is. Uh, so CJA, the Commission for International Justice and Accountability, I just happened to read about, I can't even remember exactly when, I think it was 2014, because I myself had started to do some reading about if there were type particular responses in relation to Syrian accountability mechanisms. Um, and once I started trying to find out more um, beyond a newspaper article, I was really surprised because I couldn't actually find out anymore. <laughs> um, there was nothing official, there was no website, no academic journal articles available. Um, luckily, I finally was able to source the email address of the director, uh, Dr. William Wiley, and from there I could learn more. Essentially, CJA um, is a private entity. It was registered in, in the Netherlands and uh, it was funded initially by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office um, in the UK, who had approached its, its director, William Wiley, sa saying in 2011, why don't we have some training made available to some Syrians working there at the coalface, so to speak, in human rights, broadly speaking. And, and Wiley countered to say, no, 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 I'm not interested in, in human rights. I'm interested in gathering evidence to a criminal tri trial standard with the hope that in the future there will be a trial that can bring Assad 
Islamic State, which obviously didn't exist at that time, um, other opposition um, figures to trial domestically or internationally. So very much from the beginning, there was this emphasis on um, the amassing of quality linkage evidence in particular um, that was quite similar to what we see actually um, that emerged from the tribunal for Yugoslavia because the regime types in some ways are quite similar. And how do they operate? How do they collect this evidence? Under the radar, quote unquote. So um, the, the beauty of CJA is as they describe themselves, they have a higher risk tolerance. Um, so essentially they were able to send people in covertly. They were able to um, build up networks within the country to train Syrian lawyers who themselves had no experience usually in criminal law, definitely not in international criminal law or human rights law before the conflict. So it was very much starting from scratch for the personnel, the local personnel there, bringing in some foreign expertise, usually from people who had worked at the international criminal tribunals before themselves, maybe had, you know, didn't have another job, had found themselves at seizure, were slightly frustrated with the public bodies for all of these reasons. They worked together with the Syrians in the field um, with, at their headquarters, whose location I can't disclose. So there was this attempt to build um, a body of personnel that could A, get the material, literally just the paper, which I've seen myself just piles and piles of, um, you know, slightly messy uh, documents, but also witness statements. So not just witnesses who have been themselves um, survivors of torture, but the key types of witnesses that CJ has really tried to, to, um, to, to uh, target um, have been, uh, uh, re say, regime defectors, so for example. It sounds a little bit cloak and dagger operation. I mean, they are at risk, aren't they? The government can't be very favorable. Uh, no, they wouldn't. I'd say that they're entering Syria um, under that name. I mean, there's, there's no <laughs> public statement to that effect. Uh, that, I mean, I suppose that's, that's the beauty and the risk of an operation like seizure. It can go in without the, the knowledge of the Syrian government, unlike, say, a, a UN body. Um, but on the other hand, then that raises questions about its legitimacy, about its accountability. Um, and it's aware of that, I think, very, <coughs> much, very much so. How long has this been going on? Since 2011, so almost a decade. But it's really uh, grown since 2013 when its budget got much larger. And how would you assess the results? I think the results we could look at in terms of financing. Initially, <coughs> there, there were only um, <coughs> three individuals working for CJA, uh, three or four, and there were not enough funds coming from the FCO to pay for their operations in Syria. So William Wiley, the director, director had to co-fund this initial operation with his own private money from his consulting firm in, that was based in the Middle East. It now has a budget over 7 million euros. So that speaks to a very large increase and in its success. the budget comes from? Around seven European states. So actually public money, not exactly, private. Exactly, exactly. That, that's one of the key dimensions here. I, we very much see it as a public-private partnership, I would say. It's not solely private. It's, it's, it's some private means working to enhance public, public ends and through, for example, trials or accountability in the long term. So I think it's important, even if it doesn't result in trials, mm -hmm. just documenting, having yes. a record of what ha is happening. Otherwise, it just might all wash away with the sort of s river of history. Uh, you conceptualize this work as entrepreneurial justice. Tell us a little bit about what you mean by this. Yeah. Well, during my interviews, I have to say, firstly, before I had come up with this concept, I was struck by the language used by some of my interviewees. A very similar jargon, let's call it, being used again and again. Seizure product, risk tolerance, cost effectiveness. Now, all of these words struck me as more management speak, words that I wouldn't necessarily think of as equating to, say, you know, public international criminal trials. So there was very much this sense of a need for innovation, for marketing themselves. So increasingly, it seemed that actually this was an innovative endeavor that we could see it as something like entrepreneurial. And I think the key, the key idea behind entrepreneurial justice is this idea that there's still this aim t for achieving justice, as we would expect from a sort of typical international criminal law narrative of redemption. 
but it's, there's also a critique and this awareness that there's a problem. So it's about identifying a gap in current public approaches to international criminal justice and then trying to fill the gap, at least partly, through innovative means. And in this case, private means. Is it just a label? Because I could think, for example, that it could be a label that would fit a whole myriad of NGOs, not only in international criminal law, just where NGOs step in because they think that public uh, bodies are not doing the job, so to speak, in a satisfactory manner. So I, I can think of entrepreneurial justice as a label, or do you give it a little bit more conceptual and theoretical substance in terms of here are the criteria which would define in entrepreneurial justice that, say, would not apply to every NGO that is in the business of advancing justice? Yeah. So. I think that I haven't developed it in detail in this article because this article is very much about telling a number of different stories. Um, but I think the, the key points I want to make would be identifying a gap in a field that is failing because I would say that actually the international criminal justice field is failing. Um, and then trying to fill the gap through an innovative approach. So I don't think it's enough for an NGO simply to say, well, you know, we're doing this, because if it's what everyone else is doing, then actually it's more of the same. So I think we need to show how the innovation is distinctive. So I was really trying to get a sense of the extent to which CJ is distinctive, and I think I need to do my work, more work myself on that, because that then requires a lot of comparative work um, with other entities. But I think we can see that, in fact, some other NGOs and public bodies are responding to this critique that CJ has raised by taking on this language of, say, cost effectiveness or, or risk tolerance. And that, that's sort of where the work could, could, could expand. So, so here are a couple, two or three uh, more critical questions. Uh, how do we evaluate this? Because on the one hand, the narrative and the analysis, and that's why we're publishing, are really interesting and in some ways impressive. People are risking their lives, they're going in there, they're training, they're collecting thousands of pages of documentation, etc. But still, after 10 years, not a single prosecution, nobody has been brought to account. So from that perspective, you could say it's a failure. It tried to identify a gap and it has not closed the gap. Yeah. So how do you evaluate what they're doing? So. I do think there have been successes. Uh, there has been a lot of um, interaction between CJ and domestic governments in Europe, that, and they have fed a lot of information to trials that actually are ongoing at the moment in Europe for, based on universal jurisdiction um, of Syrians uh, who have committed alleged war crimes who are now in the jurisdiction, for example, in Sweden or Germany. And there has been collaboration, not just with CJ, but other NGOs who are now, let's say, more savvy in the techniques of, of say, international criminal law linkage evidence collection. So I would say that that is actually something. I mean, it doesn't mean that we have Assad on trial. That will be the ultimate question, <laughs> or maybe Putin. Um, you know, but I don't think we're ever necessarily going to get that. So we have to work out what our measure of success would actually be in the field. I do think more is required. I, I agree there. Um, so that's all you're saying is it's not totally be in vain. But, you know, stepping back from it, we still don't know, even if you marshal the evidence, it's had an impact on this government, on that NGO, etc. Is there a methodological tool of actually creating a yardstick of success? Because the way you, you pose it in your article is you say entrepreneurial justice is important because it closes gaps, etc. But we would need some kind of yardstick or measurement to know to what extent it is closing the gap. Yeah. And what you've just said doesn't really do that. It just says it's not totally in vain, but we still don't know mm -hmm. how important or unimportant is it. Uh, over 10 years, that's $70 million. Yeah. Which is, I suppose, the cost of one missile. Uh, so very little, but still a lot by some reference to budgets. So maybe more work needs to be done there on the measurement of success. Absolutely. I mean, we do now have the uh, UN mechanism for Syria, the uh, which is, was which created, you talk about uh, yeah, in your which was created in December 2016, and CJ has now passed all of their files over to the mechanism, and the mechanism has amassed an absolutely huge, astoundingly huge amount of material, um, which again, it's good to think about how it can use. So 
we're pe you know everything's pending in that sense as to how we can assess it. In terms of Siege's work, it now is expanding in lots of different fields. So that speaks to potentially its success. Uh, we do see some more collaboration between Siege and other public bodies. I can't talk about that because a lot of this is still quite quite early days. So mm -hmm. I'm assured by members at Siege that they can see its successes, you know, in various fields in, in various countries. But I agree, if, if you were to ask me point blank, how can we measure it? Well, because I can't even divulge some of those details, it's, I, I can understand why you'd f find that frustrating. So I do think though we need a little bit more time um, in which to assess it. It would be important as you continue with this work, even if you can't divulge detail, to provide us for an analytical yes. framework yes. for how to measure the impact. So let's talk a tiny bit about the methodology. Because in large measure, uh, the empirical data is collected by interviewing people who are part of the Commission on International Justice and Accountability. Uh, that's a problem. Absolutely. Because it's like assessing the efficacy of the European Union by talking to commissioners of the European Union. Uh, how, how, how do you think about that? Didn't you feel that you might just be co-opted into their view and uh, almost become a spokeswoman for the commission rather than an independent scholar who's assessing it from the outside? How, what were your thoughts on that? I felt deeply uncomfortable, deeply uncomfortable. So when I've shared my work or my initial ideas with some colleagues in, in the field of international law, some of them were, were highly skeptical and they sort of suggested that this type of work is simply not uh, academically rigorous enough to pass as a scholarship. So I really struggled with this question. It's published in Asia, <laughs> it, is, it is scholarship. <laughs> I really, but, but, yeah, we, but we have the same uh, questions we were asking ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, part of it is to fudge it, I would say, to ground any, any work that you do in, in debates about, for example, international criminal justice, about the ICC, about Syria, but that's not enough. I, th I had to really confront this more head on and I actually do that in another piece where um, I basically read a lot of material from anthropology um, on this practice called power ethnography, which is essentially where it's a little bit like what we're doing now, where we have a discussion between two individuals in a field where one individual interviewing actually learns from the person whom they're interviewing. Um, and so it's almost like this shifting of expertise. I, I actually gained a lot of knowledge from my interviewees. And because we were both international lawyers when I was sitting down, largely speaking to, to my interviewees, it was this really wonderful encounter. But it, I don't think there was ever an expectation that I was being co-opted uh, or, or, or being made to be a spokesperson because I was never really told any of the intimate details, for example, about but the organisation. But you were also not, sh excuse me, you were yep. also not shown the dark side of the moon. No. And every moon has a dark side. I have been shown a little bit of it. I have spoken to a few people who have left CJA. Um, who that have doesn't show yeah, so much in the piece we are publishing. Because they've asked me not to include those details. But those insights from some other people, the highly critical, has enabled me to have a little bit more insight as to the nature of the organisation. Um, and as over time I have gained closer relationships with people in the organisation and spent more time with them, there has been a, there's been more opportunity, I suppose, for more criticism, including from, you know, people themselves still, still working there. But I agree, it, it's, it's a really difficult situation in which I find myself. So I'm, I'm, I'm very cognizant of that. I hope though that I can, I can show in my article that I'm not just wholly supportive of, of the, of the CJA model. Like no, that, that comes through, you're right. It, it is so, and you, it's laced with question marks and little critical questions. What, so the issue is how one would address that as your work goes ahead. So maybe we can conclude by you telling us in relation to this issue, what's your future agenda? Where yep. is the work going to go from now? On, from on, here. on yes. CJA. Yes. Is CJA. Um, well, this was a sort of opening piece. and. And as we can see in the article itself, some, some, there are some key themes that I think need to be explored more. The theoretical framework of entrepreneurial justice could be developed further. 
the archive amassed, not only by CJA, but particularly actually now the, the Syria mechanism, all of these NGOs, and the, the questions of the constituency of this archive, what's going to be done with it, the political ramifications of it, that has really fascinated me. So I'd like to do more work on that, especially if we have no trials. So what do we do with this material? How does it inform a future for, for Syrians um, moving forward? Is there any reason why it's not being made public? Uh, well, because of the sensitivity of it um, in terms of the implications for people still in Syria. Yeah, but you, there are ways of getting around that. One yeah, can redact yeah. it, yeah. one can anonymize it. It's partly the volume as well. Um, it will actually take years to properly administer all of that. So I think we're still at the phase of just trying to get a handle on things, particularly the mechanism, um, even just in terms of the technological prowess required. Um, there's more, you know, there are more hours of video to watch than the entire conflict. So it's, it's difficult to know what to do with all of this material. I'd also like to work uh, on the question of capacity building because very much it, this is not just an entity focused on criminal trials. It's also about the possibility of training uh, future international criminal lawyers in third world states in the midst of civil conflict. And I think that's quite an interesting question where we see the elision between development and international criminal justice and whether or not actually that's something that's feasible. And that needs to be assessed potentially in the future. So I think our viewers and our readers <coughs> will agree that the Syrian situation, to say that it's frustrating is an understatement. And we were happy to publish this because with the article we just discovered there's a whole world under the radar that is operating there and uh, I think there should be considerable interest in what you've written and then taking it further, mm -hmm. asking the critical questions, uh, contemplating and reflecting on the methodology, what would be alternative methodology. So on behalf of everybody, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.